Welcome to today's episode of the Declutter Hub podcast, your channel for super easy, no-nonsense advice on how to declutter and organize your home. Please welcome your hosts, professional organizers, Ingrid Jansen and Leslie Spellman. Hello and welcome listeners to episode 82 of the Declutter Hub podcast. I'm Leslie. If you have clutter and want to sort it out, this is the show for you. In today's episode, I'm talking to Jill. Jill has been a client of the Clutter Fair for over eight years. And in a podcast a few weeks ago, Jill shared her journey with us about her relationship with stuff and her hoarding tendencies, which was really, really profound and will have resonated with lots and lots of people. So if you've not listened to that one, please go back and listen to that one first so you've got some context for this podcast. One of the things that Jill mentioned while she was talking about her relationship with stuff was the thing that she struggles most with is her craft stuff. So Jill has an excessive amount of craft stuff in her home still that she really, really struggles to part with. So today I'm going to delve a little bit deeper into that craft stuff and try and work out what it is about crafting that makes it go hand in hand with clutter. So welcome, Jill. Hello. Now this is the this is the bit that you're really going to like talking about craft because I know it's um, it, it's something that gives you great delight and makes you super happy. So rather than delving deep into your hoarding tendencies as we did in the last podcast today, we can talk about the fun stuff. Do you think it's fair to say that you've got an excessive amount of craft stuff in your house? Uh, no, no, I th- I think that's really unreasonable. I think full rooms full of craft stuff is perfectly sensible. <laughs> I think my problem is it's just not organized. No, you you're completely right. I probably have enough craft stuff that would keep me going till I was probably 120. And one of my big issues is I can never find what I want which is probably why I sometimes have two or three of the same thing. And it would make life so much simpler if I could just put my hand on it and use it when I need it. And it would be so much pleasanter to do the crafting. I now spend so much of my time trying to find things and losing my temper because I can't. It becomes, yeah... It is a frustration. One of the things that we have done while we've been working at your house, and and the craft stuff has generally been reasonably off limits in terms of getting rid of things in any in any volume that's going to really make a difference. But we have done put some organisational systems in place to make it a little bit easier for you to find things, haven't we? So we've used a lot of Calax units, which are the IKEA units with the the cubes and the kind of inserts into them, and so we've got those split up into the way that. You would expect crafting to be split up, embellishments, adhesives, papers, blah, blah. You know, anybody who crafts knows what those categories are. And so we have made it a little bit easier, but you've still got huge volumes, haven't you? So it's difficult, as you say, for you to find exactly what you need. So what do you think it is about crafting and clutter that makes them go hand in hand, Jill? Um, I think people who craft often want the new things, the new toys, the new tools. Every season there's new stamps come out, there are new embossing folders, there are new gadgets to use the embossing folders and it's not enough to have last year's. We always want what's coming this year. It probably doesn't help me that I actually teach crafting as a hobby in my spare time so I always feel like I need to be up to date but where a lot of my friends who are better organized crafters will actually get rid of last year's stock I hold on to it and I hold on to things I don't like very much like I did with the clothes and one of the mainstays of of the sort of crafting I do are the stamps and the papers and it's not enough to have one sheet of paper I need to have at least two one to use and one to keep and then some of the papers are so beautiful I can't even bear to use them so it's a kind of desire to get the latest thing it's almost like the shiny new toy sort of scenario isn't it that you always want the new things that you can keep up all the time Because the thing is, it's something that genuinely makes you happy, isn't it? So crafting is something that fills you with joy and therefore you want to get the stuff to facilitate that happening. 
that that's right and I, th I think I've always felt I wasn't very creative so I finally found a hobby where I can produce beautiful works of art and show other people how to create beautiful works of art and it's an outlet it's something that when I'm crafting I can't think about anything else work goes away troubles go away you're concentrating on a very small piece of your desk and it's lucky it needs to be a small piece of desk because often there's more clutter than I need but for five six hours I can just play with my toys and come up with some lovely cards and it's just so peaceful and everything else just recedes all all the world goes away I, I can find myself you know I'll have started crafting in the morning and I've not eaten, I've not had a drink, and it's two o'clock in the, the next morning because you get so involved in what you're doing. So it's definitely escapism, is it, and an enjoyment all sort of wrapped up into one? Uh, absolutely, yes. So you talk about not thinking of yourself then as a creative person. Now, I can absolutely say that you are definitely a creative person because I've seen the output, which is absolutely beautiful. If you don't consider yourself to be a creative person, what do you think it was that brought you into craft in the first place? My job is one where I do a lot of reading and a lot of scientific work. All the degrees I did were very scientific Everything I did seemed to be very cerebral, very focused on the brain. I had a mum who sewed, a gran who knitted, an aunt who could knit, sew, craft, cook, whatever. And I never felt I could do any of those things very well. You know, my paintings looked like a three-year-old. Every time I tried to sew, whatever I sewed didn't fit me. I couldn't knit, couldn't crochet. And I was desperately looking for something that did actually look like what I was wanting it to look like and I found card making because you start with an image that you can then colour or stamp it just takes you half the way there and the older I've got the more you know you now buy adult colouring books and maybe that would have saved me money. So we talked in the last podcast about when you took up crafting and so that was about a year before your mum died then your mum died very suddenly. And so did that put a stop to your crafting or how did that progress from there? So I, I found something I enjoyed doing, but I didn't feel like I had any time. I was busy traveling and working and all and being superwoman. So rather than stopping the crafting, I just carried on buying ready for when I want it to start again. And that's when it really got out of hand. My particular poison was watching QVC. At the time I was doing this, they had craft days. And on a typical craft day, I could easily spend £600. And the boxes would arrive over the next two weeks and they'd be put in a pile. And I don't actually remember opening them. They would have craft days maybe once a month. And I remember being really shocked at the end of the first year after my mum died, being invited to a QVC event because I was one of their top spenders. So I had all this craft stuff in my house, none of which had I opened or used. And that pattern probably went on for three or four years. I know you have shared with me, Jill, and I know that you are happy to share you feel as if you've put a figure on how much you think that you've spent on craft stuff over the years, don't you? When I wasn't opening stuff, so we're not talking about what I'm spending now, but when I wasn't opening stuff, I would say in those four years, I probably spent around £50,000. And that's a, that's a colossal amount of money, isn't it, by anyone's standards? Yep, but, and um, that and, and I couldn't sure, afford it. Yeah, and you couldn't afford it. I'm sure it's something that retrospectively you're not proud of, but it's something that became a compulsive habit. And I, I wasn't just spending on QVC. I was going to craft events and I could easily go to a craft event and spend a thousand pounds. I traveled to craft shows. I traveled to craft classes. So I didn't actually do any card making at home but I did go to classes and when I went to a class, whatever we used, I would buy. And it was 
it was overwhelming what you described last time those little paths through a house my house was slightly smaller at the time and there literally was a path from the front door and I got to a stage where I couldn't cook because I couldn't get into the kitchen so I was living on takeaways and up both sides of the stairs there were boxes and it was probably four years after my mum died that I finally went to the doctor and asked for some help and the lady who did some counselling for me came to my house and I think she was gobsmacked when she saw it the reason she'd had to come to my house was because I had stepped over a pile of boxes and shattered the bones in my foot and so I couldn't go to her because I couldn't drive and I laugh about it now it was a really difficult time and she did help my me by opening the boxes and getting rid of them and putting things like things together but it was just such an overwhelming amount and I couldn't do anything about it and at the time when you first start crafting every new craft sounds and looks interesting and you want to try it so anybody who's done card making may have heard of things like lucido and colossal and they were all things i i bought kits for and was going to try but never got round to it looking back on it now your tea bag folding doesn't do it for me but i have kits for tea bag folding i absolutely hate decoupage but i've got hundreds and hundreds of sheets of decoupage because at the time it seemed like a good bargain why wouldn't I try it so it took probably me moving back up north and starting to teach classes again here to really recognize that I enjoy stamping and therefore I probably have a lot of things I will never use but it's now a case of I've got so much finding it to get rid of it is not that simple. Well, it's one of the things that we've spoken about, Jill, isn't it? While we've been working together is the logistics of actually um, letting go of the stuff. And where do we where do we take it in such huge volumes? And we have got rid of stuff um, out of your house. Certainly those things that you no longer are, are that interested in, like decoupage and things. And we we sent things off to to charity didn't we one of the things that we yes. did which was successful wasn't it and we will revisit again this year when we're going at it a little bit um harder is that we put a, a note on a local facebook group didn't we for charity we said there was a lot of craft stuff to offload and that we want that you wanted to donate and so i think you chose four or five different charities didn't you and you sent them a huge box full of stuff each didn't you and they were so um, grateful and that's a fantastic outlet as well but that, again, those four or five boxes were still a drop in the ocean compared to the amount of stuff that you've actually still got. So logistically, we've talked about having a sale in like a, a haul. I haven't wait. There's loads of things that were, but how yeah. do we get rid of this stuff in such huge volumes is something that we still struggle yeah. with, isn't it? To, to be fair, it was actually 29 large boxes I got rid of. Oh, oh. Um, <laughs> she's fighting back. <laughs> she's fighting back. I'm fighting back, yes. <laughs> yes, I, I felt every single one of them. Most of them were too heavy to lift. It, it was really nice because a lot of the things I got rid of, I haven't missed because they were things that I had grown out of probably at the, about the time I bought them. But it is a problem because stamps, you know, a typical wooden stamp, and that's what I used to be buying 10, 15 years ago, they would cost you 10, 12 pounds. So you're never going to get back what you paid. But equally, it's almost like a mother and child relationship. You don't want it going to a bad home. I had wasted a lot of money buying those things. With every box that you got rid of, you were confronted yeah. with that wastefulness, I guess. And it's not something that you necessarily want to revisit with everything else that you're going through at the time. No, that's right. And it does hurt. Again, back to my mother who always said, oh, it'll come in one day. I suppose that is also paper doesn't go off. So why wouldn't I keep the paper? But when you've got 40, 50 
full scat boxes full of paper do you really ever get through that much you collect buttons because you can use buttons on cards well how many thousands of buttons do you actually need I suppose I'm lucky in that if I do get rid of something and in a year's time suddenly want it again I can go out and buy it it's not going to kill me but you know I do sometimes think I've spent all this money what have I got to show for it and I think you just have to stop thinking like that one of my big issues one of the things that takes up boxes and boxes is cards I've already made and when I first started I always used to think oh that's a really great sample that I can copy and do something else with but I think it's been in the last year the realization that actually I don't ever go back and look at my samples I make new things and when you see new papers and new stamps new ideas come so I've started selling my handmade cards at work very cheaply it doesn't make me a fortune but it does actually get them out of the house i've also started donating cards to charities that my friends support so um i gave one friend over 200 cards just before christmas and she's made over 300 pounds for the air ambulance and that makes me feel good. It makes me feel like I'm doing something for other people. And it's important as well because it's the fruits of your labour, isn't it? You know, so it's not just something, there's, an, there's an, an extra layer in there. So it's not just something that you've bought that you've given away. You've not bought a skirt, donated a skirt. In the, in the middle of, of that is the creativity and the energy that you've put into that project. So the output is, is even more difficult to offload to somebody else, isn't it? You can't just give it away because, again, you're proud of what you have done as well. Yes, and I like the idea of a handmade card. If I make somebody a handmade card for their birthday, it's nice to know they've appreciated it. Um, one of the things I've been doing over the last few years is I make Christmas cards for all my staff at work. And they all look forward to what they're going to get and the last two years I've stopped making them and actually found ones that I have made over the past few years and sadly I found another box just after Christmas and it's like oh oh well that's next year sorted out as well so it's it's getting easier to use things I think there's probably only one card I've ever made that I will never give away and I just love it it's so beautiful it's got Swarovski crystals on it and it's a very exclusive paper but all the others why why not use them it's a bit like when I was little I had a best coat that I could only wear on Sundays to go to see my gran and I grew out of it within six months and it had been worn less than 20 times and I sort of feel a bit the same with crafting if you're not using it it has no value to you you may as well pass it on and if you get a bit of money back great so I'm, I'm thinking that you know with some of my stamp sets I probably need to eBay them and it I'm planning to retire it might not happen till then but just trying to sort things out and get rid of more of the stuff I'm never going to look at again it's easier now than it used to be I'm excited for what 2020 is going to bring Jill because as mentioned in the last podcast we have got a lot of sessions scheduled in well not a lot we've got 12 sessions scheduled in this year so I'm trying to see once every month because you still are very busy with work and away a lot of the time I'm bringing a second person with me as well so that kind of doubles up on the amount of effort and output that we can give you and so I know one of our goals is for you to be able to use your garage which you, which you want to convert into a crafting space that you can invite people over and have craft sessions in your home so do you see that happening this year I absolutely do I want it to happen and again I've been holding on to things in the garage I've not been in the garage for I hate to think how many years why am I holding on to it and it has been a long time coming you've been working with me for eight years on and off and I've hung on to things 
anything that's in the garage I haven't used in years. I haven't been in to look for anything. So really, why am I holding on to it? And I'm starting to be able to see that. When you first came, I, I remember fighting over wooden spoons. I had something like 15 and you'd only let me keep three. Jill, and Jill, now... can I just stop you there? Can I just stop you? Because th this, is not, this is not sounding good when you say <laughs> fighting and you say, I wouldn't let you. That is not good professionally. <laughs> that might be the way you remembered it, but that's not the way that it went, by the way. <laughs> you persuaded me. Okay. <laughs> I'll end up with no job here. She's the one who was there and was fighting in the kitchen over wooden spoons. This is not good for business. <laughs> okay. Okay, you may I, proceed. I, yeah. <laughs> so, you, you were forceful and you were persuasive and you pointed out the error of my ways. I wasn't particularly happy about it at the time. But again, looking back, I now have no wooden spoons. I don't miss them. And I can honestly say in eight years, I don't think there's anything I can think of that we've got rid of that I actually have missed or felt I needed. When we started, that wasn't the case. I actually thought I needed to hang on to everything. <laughs> so it's, it has been, it's been a journey. And I think the craft stuff is probably the one that's going to be the hardest. It's definitely going to be the hardest, for sure. It's been the thing that has been the most difficult right throughout. So as I mentioned in the last podcast, it has been very much the phased approach. There's been steps and you've been more willing each time we've got rid of more. And, you know, I think a lot of people, and you talked about buying a decluttering book and people saying, start small and do one drawer and things like that. And you know, in the Declutter Hub, we advocate starting small as well. But sometimes it's so overwhelming for people. No two homes and no two situations are the same and there's not a one size fits all. So yes, ideally, if you can start with a drawer, the idea is that you don't start with something that's hugely overwhelming. So what we're trying to do is rein people back in from thinking, I want to declutter my whole house this weekend because that becomes overwhelming and you will undoubtedly probably fail at your endeavours if you do something as colossal as that. And so that's why we encourage people to start small. But for somebody who has got an irrational holding on to things and is acquiring too much for lots of different psychological reasons. It's not the same, Jill. It's a very different experience that you had. And yes, you know, when I'm working with someone who's been hoarding, then I have to work in a different way as people with standard, if there is such a thing, clutter. The emotions are very similar, but there's that irrationality to it which is different. And of course, you're going to see that encounter that we had in the kitchen that I can't remember. I'm scared now that I actually was fighting it. It's a very negative no. thing because you didn't want it, you know, and you were digging your heels in it. And what, what my job is, and then there would be no point in me coming and saying, okay, well, just keep your 20 spoons. I'm there to try and push you a little bit out of your comfort zone. Even five spoons is probably too many, but let's find a compromise somewhere in the middle. And that's what it's all about when you're working with anybody, whether that's a professional organizer or whether that's someone that's just coming in to help. It should be led by you. But I guess to see a change, you have to make a change. So therefore, you have to push yourself slightly out of your comfort zone. That comfort zone is so difficult when there are psychological issues involved in it, it's not as easy. If people have got hoarding disorder, we as professionals understand what that feels like. And we understand you can't just do what everybody else sees as perfectly normal, which is, well, just chuck away all your stuff. Why are you keeping four rooms worth of stuff, Jill? Because it's obviously holding you back. Just chuck it all away. Life is not as simple as that. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I know part of the reason you've been visiting for over several years is you know the first time we did the bedroom we got rid of a lot of stuff I felt and the second time we got rid of even more and it was a lot easier to give away the clothes and the shoes and the handbags the second time round and the third time round even easier again so I can see that process and the kitchen was the same when I reflect back I think the first time you visited you took something like 38 boxes and bags of stuff out of the kitchen and it echoed when you left 
and it was such a beautiful sound so you didn't feel like you'd achieved as much as you wanted because I was still holding on to those three spoons but it was a turning point I wasn't sure I was going to invite you back but every day when I went in and I could cook and I could turn the tap on and I could actually see the surfaces it was like yeah it's a good thing so it's it's not pleasant it can be painful I certainly feel exhausted at the end of a session but I kept inviting you back <laughs> yes I'm still here this is good <laughs> and you're speaking to me on my podcast which is even better so Jill amazing stuff so thank you so much for sharing I guess the point that I'm trying to make here is if you are suffering with hoarding disorder or hoarding tendencies or anything like that or you have an inkling or you find it incredibly difficult to to get rid of stuff and to function if your home is not what you want it to be it's stopping you from living the life that you want to lead there are professional organizers out there who understand who empathize who will work with you don't be scared there are so many people i'm talking to somebody at the moment who's so nervous to call we're chatting on messenger she's very very nervous about calling because it's a very very scary thing to get somebody into your house after several years of not having shared what your house looks like on the inside but don't be scared because what we don't do is we don't judge we never judge we we have a job because there are people out there with a lot of clutter. So sometimes people find it easier <laughs> to think, oh yes, they don't know. If you, do, if you don't have clutter, we don't have a job. We absolutely love what we do. We love being able to make a difference to people. And we recognize that some people we can sort out their houses in a couple of days and other people, it's going to span 20 years and we're there for the long haul. I think this year is going to be a real turning point for Jill and I'm excited to go through that with her. And so thank you, Jill. It's been amazing. I think this year is the year that we're going to get those craft rooms down to at least one less. Does that scare you? It does. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> she's like, no, it was all going so well. Don't say scary things. <laughs> no, we're definitely going to get that garage up and running. That's the most important thing. And I'm going to get those Calax units of um, four sections of adhesives down to two. <laughs> <laughs> like the wooden spoons if I could do 75% of the wooden spoons I feel like I can do that with the adhesives as well that's where I'm that's what I'm thinking anyway and, so, and certainly you you know a lot more about what things are called now <laughs> I know Jill Jill's eyes just roll around because I as we as we've shared many times on this podcast I'm a very pragmatic person I do not have a creative bone in my body and so embellishments and stamps and stencils and it's just all a little bit too much for me and Jill's like we've been through this 20 times Leslie that's called a I can't even think what it might be now I've told you what that is what's this Jill what's this Jill so um yeah it's a big learning process for us as well so thank you so much Jill I hope you've enjoyed talking on the Deco Tub podcast it's not been too traumatic has it it hasn't no and I hope it has made somebody come forward you, you're really not that scary and I wouldn't be where I am if it hadn't been for you. Oh, thank you. Um, just to mention the, the association where you can find a professional organiser near to you. If you're in the UK, it's APDO, the Association of Professional Declutterers and Organisers. If you're in the States, there is NAPO. So there are associations right across the world where you can find a professional organiser close to you. Some people are specialists in hoarding, so seek those out as well. There's lots of help and tips and advice at Hoarding UK and lots of other hoarding associations, which we will put in the show notes as well for you. So thank you so much, Jill, for being a part of our podcast. And listeners, I hope you have learned a lot today and it's been interesting for you to listen to Jill's story. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen today. If you want to get more tips and advice, please do follow us on social media. We're on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook as at Declutter Hub and have a lively, supportive Facebook group where we chat all things clutter. You can search for the Declutter Hub community. We'd love to see you there. Don't forget our members area too. If you feel like you want some help, with Ingrid and I helping you through your decluttering journey. We offer step-by-step -step online courses. Every two weeks we go live and we answer all of your decluttering questions. And so it's very personal. 
and we also have a membership community where lots of like-minded people come together to share their journeys as they're going through them. And if you don't want to miss the next weekly episode of our podcast, please subscribe to the Declutter Hub podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher and iHeartRadio and it will pop into Thanks your Thanks for listening to this week's Friday. episode of so the Declutter so much, Hub podcast. See you next time. Check out declutterhub.com for more inspiration and don't forget to tune in next week.